1 Corinthians 13, John 3, Matthew, where are we going to start here? Let's start at John 3, and then we'll go to the um, crucifixion story. There's one in each gospel. And make sure I'm on here. Yes, sir. John chapter 3 is what it's all about. The stories in the Old Testament, I believe, are true and they have to be true because Jesus related so much of what he did to the Old Testament. Uh, he linked it. The story of Jonah. Science says that Jonah, the story of Jonah and the whale cannot be true. God says it is true. Jesus himself said it was true. Uh, I even heard back in my college days that there were scholars who did not believe the book of Jonah should even be in the Bible because it was just, they, they called it a myth. And, um, but Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So if Jonas did not exist, then how can Jesus do what he did? Uh, so I believe both are true. Jesus himself said that they, they were connected. And in this case here, in John chapter 3, you have the story of Jesus coming to Nicodemus uh, alone, which is, I think, how the gospel is. I'm not saying it's the only way for people to get saved, but it's, it's one of the best ways. Uh, we know that in Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost by the public preaching of Jesus Christ. But we also know that Jesus went to Nicodemus by himself. He went to him alone. Nicodemus, of course, was one of the 70 elders of Israel. He was one of the appointed men to be the rulers of Israel. So he already had not only a religion, but he had a position in that religion, a high standing position in that religion. And so the idea that all religions worship the same God, Jesus did not believe that. Jesus knew that this man was undone and he was unfit for the kingdom of heaven. And he said he must be born again. So he's teaching Nicodemus the truth of the gospel and he's bringing up stories of the Old Testament. And he said in verse 14 of John chapter 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what that story is based on is in the book of Numbers, when the Israelites murmured and complained against God, which we've all done it. We've complained to God. We've told God that he made a mistake or he's not doing it right or how come we're having to go through this. And that's what the Israelites did. And so God allowed devils, what amounts to devils. They were, they were fiery serpents to come in and as they bit those people who were God's people because of their complaint against God they died serpents are poisonous and they those people died when they asked Moses for remedy against the poison of the serpents Moses went to God God said Moses make a serpent out of brass and put it on a pole, a brass pole, and I want you to lift it up. And he said, I want you to tell the people that if they will look upon that, then I will give them life. I, in other words, I will cure them of the serpent's poison. What that story does, it teaches us faith. Trusting what God said. Maybe what God said sounds illogical to you. Maybe it doesn't make sense to you. But God said it. And if God said it, you're either going to believe it or you don't believe it. And if you believe it, you'll look. And if you don't believe it, you'll look away. You won't be bothered with it. So those Israelites that when Moses did that, when they looked upon that because they believed. I mean, you, you get to a point in life. I've been there. Probably all of you have been there to where you, you don't have another choice. God has eliminated every other alternative for you. You've been bit by the serpent. You're going to die. And there's no way around it. There's no correcting it. There's no 
There's no remedy, there's no antidote, there's no doctor, there's no hospital. Obamacare cannot fix the problem. And so when Moses says, look upon this and you'll live, you get to the point to where you say, why not? And God doesn't have a problem with that. Because he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God says, try me now herewith. And see, see if I don't open the windows of heaven for you. See if I don't give you a blessing. Try it and see. And so to everybody, to everybody, God says, try it. Try it. The sad thing is, some people won't even do that. Some, you know how some people are. They're bullheaded. They're stubborn-hearted. And you could go to the best restaurant in the world and bring back leftovers and say, you have got to try this. You have it's Here, I don't, I'm not even asking you to go there and pay for the meal. I'm saying, I got some of it right here. Why don't you try this? And some people go, oh, I ain't eating that. It's like the guy that Sterling and I... This is how some people are, no kidding. Sterling and I were, were painting at a, at a hotel out at um, Merrimack State Park out in Sullivan. And there was working with us a guy that was a wallpaper hanger. And he was a country boy. And so in town was a Chinese buffet. And I told Sterling, I said, why don't we go there for lunch? So he said, okay. So we invited, I can't remember what his name was, I, we invited him to go eat with us. And he said, where are y'all going? And we said, we're going to this Chinese restaurant there in town. He said, ooh, no, he said, I don't go in them places. And I said, why? He said, I don't eat that food. No, he said, I don't touch it. He said, me and my boy were in that restaurant hanging wallpaper. And he said, we looked out on the tables. They had the menus right on the tables. And it said dog and horse and monkey and snake. You know what that is? It's the Zodiac. And he thought it was the menu. And I was going to say something, but I was laughing too hard inwardly. And I'm just going, I'm just going to leave that one alone. He would not, he did. He thought that was the menu that they were serving dog and horse and monkey and dragon. I don't know where you get that from. But some people are just so stubborn. They accuse us of being closed-minded. Okay? So they're, they're not going to do it no matter what. But God doesn't mind if you just try it. What's it going to hurt? Amen? So, Jesus going to Nicodemus and he tells him the story. Nicodemus already knows the story of Moses and the serpent. And those people who looked, they lived. And he's, that's why he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what he's saying is, when I die on that cross, that's, that's going to be the fulfillment of what Moses did. No, Jesus is not the serpent. He's not the devil. But he was showing how the devil can be defeated. How the serpent's poison, and we've all been poisoned by that serpent. How that serpent's poison can be remedied. And how we can have life if we will just believe in what God said. So verse 15 there, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's the true definition of God's kind of love is giving. That gave his only begotten son. Who did he give him to? The whole world. Who does God make it free for? Just the Jews? No. Just the chosen Gentiles? No. He makes it free for the entire world. Everybody, no matter how bad, no matter what, to what extent you've done it and continue to do it. The Bible says, for God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Now I want you to think about the impossibility of that statement. How could Christ die 2,000 years ago and yet be dying for you in your situation right now? Only Christ can do that. I can't do it. A lamb, an earthly lamb, cannot do it. But Jesus Christ can. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus does not come to condemn anybody. He displayed that when they brought the woman caught in adultery, threw her out in the street, ready to stone her to death. According to the law, they were ready to stone her to death. So they thought they would tempt Jesus by, by getting him to violate the law. And Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him first cast the stone. Well, that would have been Jesus who qualified for that. He was without sin. If anybody in that group was qualified to cast the stone to kill this woman for her adultery, it would have been Jesus. But not even Jesus would do that. And when everybody left, he looked at the woman and said, Is there anyone here to condemn you? And she said, No. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And Christ, at that point, forgave her of everything that she had done wrong. And I mean everything. That is God's love for sinners. And I'm going to be honest with you. I wish and pray that I could have that kind of love for lost people. It's hard to come by. It's hard to do it. But I pray for that kind of love every day. Because if God loved me that way, then God would love anybody. Anybody. There's nobody that God does not love. Um, turn to... You know what? Let's go to, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. This is the Bible definition of love. First Corinthians 13, I have it up on the screen, but I intentionally keep it small because I want you to open your Bible there and I want you to look at it. If you did not bring a Bible, there's one in the pew next to the hymn books there in front of you. So remember that God commended his love to mankind by offering his son to everybody in the world, no matter how good or no matter how bad they are. In fact, the worse you are, you're the one who qualifies for the gospel. You're the one who qualifies for the free gift. The good people, in their mind, they don't do anything bad enough to deserve hell, so they don't want it. They don't want God's free gift because they don't think that they've done anything wrong. Or they have this weird idea that they're, all their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, and that's not true. So 1 Corinthians 13 gives us God's real definition of what love, and the word here is charity. And I like the King James because it differentiates charity from the word love. There are different kinds of love in this world. There is the love for, a, you know, a, like a brotherly love, a love for people in general. I mean, if you saw someone choking in a restaurant that you didn't know, if you knew how to give them the Heimlich maneuver, you would do it. That's a generalized compassion for all people. Some people have it, some people just don't. Um, during times of war, there are people who, even though they are enemies, they display love and at least some form of compassion to people who they are enemies. And, you know, that's all well and good. There's the kind of love in this world that is a trade-off that says, I will love you and do good things for you as long as you love me and do good things for me. Uh, but that is not this kind of love here. Um, we use the word charity as a way of describing what people or corporations will do. Uh, they have charitable organizations that receive money from people, individuals, or they receive money from businesses, people with money. But... There are qualifications even for that kind of charity. 
if the IRS rewrote the tax code and eliminated charitable giving as a tax deduction, how much do you think corporations would donate under those rules? Probably nothing. They donate because they can get it as a write-off on their taxes. They're getting something back for it, even if it's not from the charity that they're donating to, they're getting something out of the federal government for it. So that's why they do it. And even people, the government allows us, allows you to take money off of your tax bill every year by writing that we, we give out a receipt every year to everybody who wants it. Some people don't want it, and that's fine. If somebody gives, under Obama's rules, if somebody gives more than $250, we have to write them out a tax, a special tax slip right then and there. It's a lot of paperwork. And people say, well, I don't want that. We can't, we'll get in trouble if we don't send it to you. We'll get in, we'll get in trouble. So we have to send it. Some people do not claim their donations to this church or any other church as, you know, they don't take it off their taxes. My view of that is, if I can take it back away from the federal government, I'll do it in a heartbeat. Amen? I'm better off with my money than they are with my money. Somebody say amen to that. So, I mean, I know you, that's not why you're doing it, but that's my opinion of it. Anyway, the word charity here, best, the Greek word is ag agape. And it literally means that kind of love where God gives freely without any sort of compensation back. That's a hard love to have, especially against people who you know hate you or you just don't like them. It's hard to do. It doesn't come easily. It comes, we learned last Sunday, it comes as a gift of the Holy Spirit. God gives you the ability to love somebody that you would not ordinarily love and have compassion on them and to do something for them that you know they don't deserve it. So, Paul defines it here, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. He starts out by describing somebody who is religious. You can be religious without being a loving person. People do it every day. Church people do it every day. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I'm become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. In other words, a gong or some cymbals or a triangle that makes just a, a noise that after a while becomes annoying. I mean, it's nice to listen to music, but it's, if kids are just banging their fingers on the piano, at some point you say, stop it. And that's what he's saying here. If I can speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I'm nothing. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. What good does it do to read the Bible, believe the Bible, study the Bible, know the Bible, quote it verse by verse, but then not love people? What good are you? There are people in this world, in religions, who could quote large portions of the Bible. But they don't love people. They don't love their enemies. And they don't love people. So what good are they? So he's describing religious hypocrisy. It is a religion that is void of of loving God, number one, and loving others, number two. So let me give you how you can be religious and not love God the way that God loves you. I've known people, and I had to counsel a pastor's wife one time because she struggled all her life with acceptance. And she was under this delusion, probably talked to her by her mother, who was in this charismatic name it, claim it stuff. And their doctrine teaches 
that you must, you must do certain things for God in order for God to do certain things back for you. And if you want God to do something for you, then you must do something for God. And of course, if you do something for God, you're doing it to get something out of God. That's what the whole charismatic doctrine is all about. It is about pleasing God or attempting to please God so you can get divine blessings from Him. And if God's not going to give you these blessings, you're not going to do for God what they're telling you to do. You're not going to say the words. You're not going to do the deeds. You're not, you're not going to do anything for God if He's not going to bless you back. That, that you don't love God, you love yourself. And Jesus, and pa Paul told that is in the last days people will come, they'll be lovers of their own selves. What they do, they're doing to get rich. What they're doing is they're doing to get healing or they're doing to get some sort of blessing from God. They're not, they're not tithing and giving to God simply out of love for God to expect nothing back. They're not doing it for that. They're doing it to get rich. Um, who was it? Somebody told me, just recently, they were at a some kind of meeting. Oh, Peter Popoff. This, I mean, he is a joke. He's been proven to be a fraud and a liar. Proven. But he brings all these people in who are poor, and he goes around and tells them, write me a check for $1,000. And if you do that, then God will give that back to you tenfold. So they're giving... And expecting $10,000 back from God. And if they don't, after a while, if they don't get the money, they're going to stop giving. Because they're doing it because they don't, they don't, they're not doing it because they love God. They're doing it because they love themselves. And so the kind of love that you can have for God is that you could do things for God and say, God, you don't owe me a thing. You don't owe me a dime. You don't have to bless me. You don't have to be good to me. God, you don't have to increase me. You don't have to make me healthy. You don't have to fill my bank account up. God, I'm doing this because I love you. It's as simple as that. Then your heart's right with God. Because you're not doing it to get something from God. God's already given it to you. You're doing it because you love him. It's the same with doing something for somebody else. People come in here off the street, they're asking for help, we try to give it to them. We try to give to everybody that comes by here. What if they're going to use it for drugs? What if they're going to use it for drugs? I don't have any control over that. There have been people where God has said, don't give them money, they're going to use it for drugs. And come to find out I was right about that, and I didn't give them anything. If they say they need gasoline, we'll take them down to the gas station and fill their tank up. If they need food, we try to give them food. Even a guy that we had in this church on a Wednesday who we just did not feel comfortable with him being here at all. We had to call the police. They came and they sent him. They took him down about 20 miles down the, down the road out of town because that's where he said he was going anyway. But when he left out of here, he left out of here with a Bible and 50 bucks. When we, the cop came back, he said... I ran his name. You were right in not allowing him to be here. He was no good. But we still gave him what we could before we sent him down the road. Is he ever going to come back? Out of all the people since I've been pastor that we have helped, giving them money, giving them gas, giving them food, every one of those people said, we'll be here next Sunday. We'll start coming to church here. They're not here and they never come. They never come. We're going to keep doing it. Because it's the right thing to do. You love people that aren't going to love you back. You love people that aren't going to serve you. You love people that aren't going to be part of your church and start putting money in your offering plate. You love them. Because what if you were in their place? You said, well, they're on drugs. What if you were on drugs? Just because they're on drugs doesn't mean they don't get hungry. And so that's the kind of love. You can be religious and not love anybody but yourself. And we already have enough people who fill that position. So we need people 
who will love people and love God unconditionally the way he loves us. So he says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, now here, here's, here it is. Now remember, God is love. Uh, I actually have that verse. Where is it? Yeah, 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So when you see in 1 Corinthians 13, the word charity, think God. And think about the gift that God can bestow upon you to love people in exactly this way. So verse 4, charity suffereth long. What does the word suffer mean? Huh? Put up with people. Lisa and I have been married be 32 years this year. I was not her dream date. I was not her prince charming. And the things that she's put up with from me, she should have never, she should have never done it. But God, God helped her to love her husband. And it's the same way. I've been mad at her. Pretty upset at times. But I love her. And we don't go to sleep at night except she has her head on my shoulder every night, same way. And may not be the most comfortable position for either she or I on any given day, but it's how we end our day. And I'm willing to long suffer with her because I love her. She's the same way with me. So you love people. And when you love them, you'll put up with their stuff. You'll put up with it. You'll suffer long. The word suffer means suffer. You'll, in some cases, you will suffer long. And I know that with us, everything has a line. And sometimes that line gets crossed. And we can't, we, there's just some things we can't take anymore. I get that. So I'm not knocking anybody. That's had to draw a line. Even God draws a line. Even God draws a line with mankind. God drew a line with angels. God draws a line with man. And God says, you know what? I've loved you all this time. And all you've done is this. So I'm going to say enough is enough. Even God does that. But charity will at least give it your best shot. You'll put up with your children You'll put up with your husband. You'll put up with your wife. You'll put up with church members. You'll put up with people at work. You'll put up with a boss. A boss will put up with you. You'll put up with the country. I love my country. And I don't like some of the things I see on the news every day. And it just... Sometimes I'm just going, I hate this country. I hate how people are in this country. But I don't want to go anywhere else and live anywhere else. And I pay my taxes. Because there are some things that the government does that are right and good. So I suffer long. And I know a lot of people who have, who have such a short fuse with everything. And they're just waiting for somebody to trip their trigger on something. That ain't right. Uh, charity suffereth long. God suffered long with you. Charity is kind. Charity says kind words to people. Not mean words. Not hateful words. Not curses. Not accusations. Not derogatory names. Charity doesn't say that kind of stuff. Charity is kind and does kind things to people. God does that. God is kind toward you. Has God given you what you deserved? No. 
Because if he gave it to you, you would not be here today. You'd be burning in hell right now. But God's kind to you. You ought to be kind to God. And that was the thing with, with the Israelites. They complained. Let me, t- let me tell you what they did. In, in Exodus 14, you go read this story. In Exodus 14, that story, you know, here's Charlton Heston. He's holding his rod over the Red Sea and the Red Sea opens up. Well, that really happened. But let me tell you the backstory behind God opening up the Red Sea. The story is that they were there, they were there at the Red Sea and God went and got Pharaoh and all of his chariots of iron, all of his armies, everything, and brought them there. And they were a threat. They were either going to drown in the Red Sea or Pharaoh was going to kill them. So you know what Israel did? They started fussing and yelling and getting mad and angry at God. They were complaining to God. What? You couldn't let us be killed in Egypt, so you had to drag us out in the wilderness to kill us? They were, they were complaining to God when God opened up the Red Sea. They were not being good to God. God was being good to them. And this crowd that says, Oh, you've got to say things in faith in order for God to do something. The Israelites were not doing that and God opened up the Red Sea anyway. Why did he do that? Because he loved them. And when you love people, you'll be kind to them, whether or not they're kind to you back. You'll open the door for people who won't say thank you. I, I like to shake soldiers' hands. I don't ask them if they're a Democrat. I don't ask them they're political. I don't ask them if they go to church. Okay? I tell them thank you for doing something that I couldn't do. So be kind to people. It won't hurt you. It won't kill you. Amen? God was kind to you and you ought to be kind to others. Be kind to God as well. Charity envieth not. That means you're not always jealous over your situation in life because you think somebody's got better than you. See, envy is what really is destroying the fabric of our nation because our leaders are pushing class envy. See, all, see this group of Americans here? They have it better than everybody else and that's not fair, so we're going to enforce policies to take stuff away from them and make them miserable and give it to everybody else. That's communism and it's not right. They're pushing and promoting class envy. Well, how come you pulled me over and you didn't pull that guy over? That kind of stuff. What, you don't like me and you like them? How come I get busted for breaking the law and nobody else, which is not true, but that's what people think. That's what people are led to think. And charity or won't do that. Charity will not, you, you'll not have people in the church who are angry at other people in the church because they had a great week and you didn't. And they come in bouncing off the wall and you're going, when you make me mad. Why? Because you're, you're envious of them. Because you think that they got a blessing that you didn't get. And it ain't right. And then I'll say this and I'll, that was the bell, wasn't it? Uh, charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. So it's wrong to not have and then envy those that have. And then it's wrong to have and then be arrogant about it. What do you have that you were not given by God? If you live in this country... You ought to wake up every day and get on your knees and tell God, thank you that you were not born someplace else. Because you've got it good. If you don't believe that, I'll take you to Kenya. And I'll take you out to Turkana. And I'll take you to the slum in Nairobi. And then you come back and you tell me how bad you've got it here. But I'll tell you. Being in the slum of Kibera in Nairobi 
when I walked in their churches, I did not see a bunch of people down and out because they lived in a slum. I saw people there who were thankful that God had given them the gospel. So charity will not, you'll not be pumped up over who you are and what you have and what you believe. You won't do that. Not if you have real, genuine love for God and for other people. You'll never, you'll never do that. You'll never give money and then want your name published for it. You'll do it privately. Uh, somebody, in fact, two people, one in this church and one outside of this church, has donated $100 to each and every widow in this church. And we're in the process of giving out now. They do not want their name mentioned. They don't want the credit for it. They don't even want a tax write-off as far as I'm concerned. They're doing it because they love God's people. And we're supposed to take care of the widows. So they're not pompous about how much they give or how much they did or what they did and want the recognition for it. They did it simply because of love and compassion and charity. And it would to God that all of God's people would be that way. Can I hear you say amen? The first person in this church to initiate the feeding program in Kenya. After that, God's people just started giving. And they're still giving. And they are still giving. But they don't want their name published in the bulletin. They don't want their name in the newsletter. They don't want their name on the internet. They're just doing it because they love people that they'll never meet who are starving to death. Father in heaven, I do not have, I do not possess the character quality of loving people unconditionally. What I have, Father, came from you. And Father, I thank you for it. And I need more of it because there's people, Father, that I'm really upset with right now. There's people, God, that I'm not sure, Lord, that I love them enough to care whether they live or die. And I need help with that. So, God, give me that kind of charity that I would do what Christ did, that I would die for them. Without a hesitation, without a complaint, I would die for them. That's the kind of love that I want for my enemies. And I do not possess it on my own. So Father, I pray, dear God, that all of your people would possess, that you would give them as a gift, the ability to love unconditionally. Bless them, Father, without getting a blessing back. And help us, dear God, to bless you and to bless others without waiting for a pat on the back. Teach us what that kind of love is really all about. Thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.